Would you like so to we'll call this meeting, meeting to order at 1801? Great. All right. Thank you, everybody. So um, <clears throat> it looks like we have some people in the audience here or in the um, on the call. So um, I think if it pleases the board, if you agree, we should allow um, as it is on the agenda, um, some public participation, knowing that it's limited to three minutes per person and we have 15 minutes until we need to move on to the discussion at hand. So um, is that agreeable to the board? Yeah. Sounds good. Okay. So now would be the time then, oh, I'm sorry. You know what, first of all, <laughs> just a little housekeeping. I have to make sure that we have our Board of Health Secretary on. She's not able to do, okay, she's here. I got her text, so we're good. Um, <clears throat> we can either do the approval of the minutes for the prior month. Do, do you wanna do that now? And then we'll move into public participation. Sure. sure. Okay. Mo motion to approve. All right. Um, approved. Juanita Carnes. Margaret? Approved. You have to state your name since it's on oh, this. Approved. Margaret Duty. Approved. Stan Stremko. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. And so um, I don't know exactly how we're going to prioritize who or, or in order of who's going to publicly participate, but um, Pete, maybe you can help out with that. If there's anybody that wants to address the board, you can unmute yourself and, um, and we'll give you three minutes for your participation. Thank you. Looks Would you like to name people? I don't you know, see the whole list of what, um, sorry, hold on. Let me get this on here. Here we go. I don't, yeah, I don't see how many people are here, but would you guys like to select people or should we just speak up? Well, right now you're the only one who's unmuted, so you can go ahead, list your name and address for the record, please. All right. My name is Tamitha Brzezinski and I live at 399 Russellville Road. Back in September, I was at the board meeting and I had um, given a few deliverables that after the meeting, Dr. Stremko had asked that I send to the board, which I did the next day. I have not received any responses to any of them. So I would like to know, will I get a response or should I do a FOIA to get those responses? I think you deserve a response. I, I have arrived at the just think we never coordinated as a as a board as to who was going to respond to you. So that's easy. We'll just have to talk about it and craft a response. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to um, address the board? Can I mute yourself? I, I would like to speak, except I don't know if I can do it in three minutes. I could do speed reading, but nobody would understand a word of it. Well, maybe you can concise what you have to say into three minutes, because that's what the guidelines are. You want to go ahead? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm going to try. And if you... Um, if you give me the hook, you do, okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay. My name is Sandra Mather. I live at 267 Sackett Road. I've lived in Westfield for 27 years, and I volunteered at the Westfield Soup Kitchen for the past 25 years. Although I don't consider myself a gambler, I'd be willing to bet a lot of money that I'm probably the only person in this meeting who got a call from a contact tracer, and that was 14 years ago. My older son was 14 at the time. He had a history of asthma that was very well controlled and did not affect his life in any way. He was in good shape, played baseball and basketball. One day I noticed his asthma seemed to be getting much worse. We saw our pediatrician who adjusted his medications. Eventually our doctor told me that they couldn't manage his illness anymore because he was getting worse and worse and he referred us to a specialist. He kept getting sicker. He missed more and more school. 
We had a nebulizer that never left our kitchen table. We had enough albuterol to fill the kitchen sink. Our medicine cabinet was filled with prednisone. He looked terrible, felt terrible, and was always exhausted. One night at dinner, his younger brother said something that made him laugh, which triggered projectile vomiting across our kitchen table. That was the beginning of a lot of vomiting. Most of it took place on the school bus on the mornings that he felt okay to go to school because that's what teenage boys do. They laugh on the school bus. I stayed in his room most nights because I thought if he stopped breathing, I'd be able to get him that much faster to Noble. Nothing helped. Both of his doctors would call me periodically at home early morning, late at night to check on his condition. I could hear the concern in their voices. I know what it feels like to lie awake at night thinking that your child might die. One day a coworker asked me what was wrong with me and I told her what was going on. She said she knew somebody who might be able to help. And I got lucky a week later, we were on our way to Boston to see the head of pediatric pulmonary medicine at Mass General. A medical student who looked about my son's age took a very detailed history. When the doctor came in the room and asked why we were there, I told him we were there for an asthma consult. At that point, he told me that that was not the case. Um, I'm not going to ask you to guess. If we had more time, I might. He told me that my son had whooping cough. I, of course, had heard of whooping cough, but I had no idea that people still got it. Um, I subsequently learned that although there was a whooping cough vaccine that had been developed decades ago, it was no longer mandatory in Massachusetts. So pediatricians stopped giving it, insurance companies stopped paying for it, and thus whooping cough was back. When the contact tracer called me, she was a state DPH nurse, and she asked me the names of everybody my son had been in contact with. I told her she needed to get a list of every student, teacher, staff, faculty, et cetera, at Westfield High School, and every student he played with in basketball and baseball. Um, you can maybe imagine my outrage knowing that my son was sick needlessly as we had an effective vaccine that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts decided we didn't need anymore. Our two local doctors, great doctors, by the way, missed his actual diagnosis because as they told me later, they just weren't seeing whooping cough anymore. The reason they weren't seeing whooping cough is because we were vaccinating our children. My son had given whooping cough to my husband who then sprained every muscle in his back from coughing and it was essentially immobilized with pain. My son also gave it to my best friend who already had her own medical issues, had multiple chronic, chronic medical conditions. Fortunately, although they both got very sick, they didn't get anywhere near as sick as my son did. My son finally started to recover after several months. After a few weeks of being symptom-free, he started again with an unrelenting coughing. I can't tell you how devastating it was to think that we were starting all over again. Our doctor told me that he had developed whooping cough syndrome and he couldn't tell us how long it would last. My son developed, we went through a series of unpleasant and very expensive tests. Eventually he got better. I will tell you, he still has a difficult time talking about that point in his life. I share this with you because I think this is my history with the unvaccinated. My name, my name may be familiar to some of you because I was involved in the Bay State Medical Project that brought vaccines to the neighborhoods. So my name was on the emails, the 10,000 or so emails that went back and forth for several weeks. We'd asked the city for $2,500 for promotional expenses and $10 gift cards. I personally was told by the mayor that this could happen. And then for some reason, the next day, there was no more money. I asked this department for an explanation and never received one. There's no question that the vaccine is now readily available in Westfield. And I appreciate everything this group has done to make that happen. What I've yet to see is the city take the lead to actively promote the vaccine. I understand that you all have other responsibilities that have nothing to do with our vaccination rate, but based on what I experienced with the Bay State Project and based on what I've seen or haven't seen from this group, I have to conclude that for some unknown reason, there have been inadequate resources devoted to increasing Westfield's vaccination rate. If you're wondering who follows your website, I'm that person. Um, I've noted that you've made some recent efforts to provide more information than previously, and that is much appreciated. But we all know that very few people follow your website, and chances are the ones who follow it are people like me, who was on my laptop in the middle of the night when the vaccine first became available, trying to get appointments for myself and my husband. I've also read your occasional articles in the local paper. But I know, like I'm sure you all do, that young people don't read newspapers. I have to believe that you all agree that Westfield's vaccination rate is not acceptable and that we can do better. 
like I said earlier, I volunteered at the Westfield Soup Kitchen for 25 years. We are now approaching our second winter handing out brown bags on the sidewalk. And I can tell you that it's gotten really old. To say that it is not the same is a huge understatement. Our volunteers and the folks who come for dinner no longer spend time in a warm, safe space or an air conditioned space in the summer. We no longer have the opportunity to share community resources, bring in guest speakers, and just check in on each other. Our sense of community is gone. Some of the folks I've known for years have dif disappeared. Some have died of COVID. Everyone wants to go back to the way it used to be and none of us see an end in sight. Maybe if we saw a significant rise in our vaccination rate in Westfield, we could open our doors again. I don't think it's enough to provide access to the vaccine. We need to let our residents know that the city of Westfield wants us to wear masks when indoors and wear them properly and that everyone eligible for the vaccine should get the vaccine. We need to get the word out that people are still getting sick, people are still dying, and young people can die too. People need to hear that the longer we have the virus here, the longer we're going to have the virus here. I believe that you have more potential. Sandra, Sandra yes. I'm sorry, I need to cut you off. We appreciate everything you're saying and agree on um, many things, but we're far beyond the three minutes and we don't have time to allow everyone to have that also. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for your input. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Anyone else that wants to address the board, you can unmute yourself and going once. I'd like to defer my three minutes to the last speaker. Thank you. Okay. And I don't even know her. Well, thank you. That was thoughtful, but we already let her go far beyond her three minutes. So, and that's not a policy that we practice. Anyone else? Yes. Um, my name is Gabriella Mihalishan. I would like to talk about um, some other early treatment and prevention alternatives that could be looked into. Um, a vitamin D deficiency, many studies have shown that to be a very large risk factor with COVID. And the only study I've seen that has been pointed to to say that it's not significant has been a study of genetic markers associated with vitamin D deficiency. So vitamin D is very important for the immune system. And it's also important for um, against depression. And as we're going into the winter where there's not, there's a, there's a high rate of vitamin D deficiency that's well known. And I'm concerned about people not being aware of the importance of supplementation of vitamin D. And I would love to see that being brought to people's attention. Um, the other piece of that is it's more important in Westfield than it is in other places because there have been studies that show that with high PFAS levels, vitamin D does not get absorbed as much as with normal PFAS levels or zero. Um, so that may be a factor in um, the COVID illness in Westfield that brings the vitamin D to a higher importance than other places. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that doctors are not allowing patients to be seen in person if they have a cough. And I don't know if you have any um, input in what they do, but the my friend couldn't bring her daughter who has asthma in to see the doctor because they wouldn't see her because she had a cough. And that was, this is actually today. And she couldn't, she would have had to sit in the waiting room. I mean, in the parking lot of an urgent care for three hours because it was totally full. Um, so there needs to be some other way to get people seen because 
my friend's daughter could end up with pneumonia because she wasn't seen and they're going somewhere. Um, so we have we have some issues that can, need to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we are at 616. Um, I believe we're past the public participation period unless the board wants to extend it. I see there is one person that's unmuted. Um, we can proceed or the board can vote to extend public participation for another three minutes. I'm okay with one more person. I, I recommend. I agree. I agree. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Is Hi. it me? Yes, Jessica, <laughs> it's you. Okay, okay, great. Um, yeah, so my name is Jessica Britton. I live in town. Um, I'm a pharmaceutical rep. Um, so I was out at the beginning of COVID. All of us representatives were. So magically, we didn't die. Magically, we all didn't come down with COVID. And we go office to office. Um, so we got shut down during the pandemic. And um, coming back into the field, we had to practice the precautionary methods of obviously going into doctor's offices and having to mask and, and keep good hygiene. Um, I think that everyone that got the vaccine in town got the vaccine. I don't think there's any kind of deficiency in the message. I don't think there's any deficiency mm -hmm. in message. the availability. I'm sorry, what? Go Did ahead. someone say something? No, oh, go okay. ahead. Okay. So I, I think like if we're trying to get to like some type of herd immunity with the vaccine, we already see in medical studies, even published in Medscape, that the antibodies wane tenfold after seven months. So you're looking at boosters every six months. So if you're going to put the carrot, in there that the masks are going to come off and we're going to go to normal. It's not going to happen. We have to go to natural immunity. And then the people that took the vaccine can keep on taking the vaccine as much as they want every six months, if that makes them feel safe. But we know from the breakthrough cases that they can still get the virus. And not only that, they can still end up in the hospital. If you even look at the Cape Cod incident, where that was like 469 people back in July, 346 were vaccinated. And then if you make the case, well, we're trying to keep everyone out of the hospital, five were hospitalized, four were vaccinated. So I think we're at the point now where we just need to stop looking for that red Corvette that we want and keep driving around, you know, because we want that red Corvette and looking for it. I think we need to start practicing a common sense and going back to somewhat of a normal way of life where doctors actually treat patients for common colds. Yep. Not everything is COVID. I know those tests are very erroneous. I know there is a lot of stuff going on in the hospitals that should not be going on. And, you know, if we're going to sit here and try to push a PSA message on the vaccination and pushing it, I think everyone needs to remember uh, number one of the Nuremberg Code. And that's the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent and should be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without any intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion. Coercion. I want you guys to think about that. And you should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved as to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. That is you clear. Mm -hmm. You're you made your point. Stuff. Thank you. Okay. Am I allowed to speak? Who's that? This is Ralph Thresher, 163 Elizabeth Avenue. Did you just join in? No, no I've been here. I, I had unmuted, but Jessica beat me. <laughs> All right. I'm okay with three more minutes, and then that's it. We need to get on with our meeting. Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to speak about, because I had noticed the people before had uh, were pro-vaccine, that's all fine and wonderful. Jessica brought up a valid point. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, known as VAERS, 
This is the one that it says anybody can report in an adverse event, but basically it's the doctors are doing this. Uh, you'll find that of the 1,373,752 cases that were reported, 48% of them involved the COVID-19 vaccine in the last 11, month, 11 months. 659,000 cases plus, which accounted for the 48% just in the last 11 months. Along with that, 9,557 deaths have been recorded from the COVID vaccine, which is basically twice as many as, as was recorded since 1990 when the VAERS website began. So to say that this is a safe vaccine in comparison to others, pertussis was mentioned, whooping cough. There were 142 adverse cases in all the time since 1990 with a 0.01% adverse event rate and no deaths from what I could find. So that's what I wanted to present. This is not a safe vaccine. Thank it you. It is a safe vaccine. I disagree. Excuse me. I just read you the statistics. Those statistics aren't consistent with anything I've seen from the CDC, the Department of Public Health, my specialty society, or in my day-to-day -day practice. All right, public participation is over. We'll get on with the meeting now. Mm -hmm. Okay, <clears throat> so um, one agenda item, very simply, is the uh, COVID discussion and update. And so I'm going to make it brief um, and just let you know, um, and, and anyone who cares to know, where our department, where our city, the city of Westfield is at right now. That's what we're here for to discuss. First of all, I'll preface it by saying that the reason why we're remote tonight, and I have been asked that question, why are we not meeting in person? And um, when you are on such a roller coaster ride of new cases, um, at some point it becomes prudent to step away and take all precautionary measures. This week we rose back up to 99 cases. Um, this, is, this is concerning. We get to that magic number of 100, which we've been in the past, uh, recently back in August, and then before that in January. And <clears throat> that's an indicator that there's, there's some sort of transmission going on, whether it's a cluster event, whether it's um, just community spread, it, it is a number of concern. Um, just percentage-wise and epidemiology-wise. So um, when I see that, and I mentioned this in my report last week about the new confirmed cases, that it was a, we actually went from 86 to 56 last week, and now we're up to 99. So you see the roller coaster we're on, and it's concerning. So to set an example of a control measure that we know works, Gatherings are not a good idea. Gatherings spread COVID. Um, masks are no masks. And so um, this is why we're remote tonight. And, um, and we'll continue to be until we see some sort of control or resolution in the new confirmed cases. So it's really all about that. Um, and, and what I wanna say is that I haven't released the report yet today, but we still are at um, this week, uh, all of the new confirmed cases, 72% were in, in unvaccinated people. And that has held steady anywhere between 65% and 80% um, since we've been tracking it. So um, <clears throat> one of the thing, and also the other concerning part of it now is that pediatric cases are on the rise again. Um, so we are working with the schools to try and control that and stop the spread. They have their own control measures in the schools with the uh, test and stay and also symptomatic testing. Um, and, and they have COVID rooms in every single school that's staffed by paramedics um, to try and help uh, control the spread in the, in the Westfield Public Schools. So we're working with them to try and, um, you know, make sure that they're they're comfortable with their methods and we are here as a resource for them. We, we, um, 
We are trying to get away from so much of the contact tracing that we've been doing the whole time. And I'm not saying it's not effective, um, but to one of the participants points earlier tonight um, <clears throat> and the buzzword, one of the COVID times buzzwords is pivot. And um, I've decided that we need to pivot into the direction of, um, and, 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 and to, uh, remember there's no mandates involved here. This is all, we're going to provide vaccine um, and have that be more accessible for the people of Westfield. So we're, we're still gonna do contact tracing because it, it has to be done to control the spread. But at the same time, uh, I feel like, yes, the vaccine's readily available, the boosters are readily available, but this has not been allowed us to have this opportunity as the local health department to provide vaccine. And in the very beginning, the state would not provide it to us. So that's how that happened. It went out to primary care and it went out to community pharmacies and it did not go to the local board of health. Now we have the ability to obtain vaccine and to offer vaccine clinics from a trusted and reputable source. Um, I had a meeting today with Bay State Noble um, and, and the discussion was that, you know, we, we want to provide people with an opportunity who want to get vaccinated with, again, the trusted and reputable source. And I'm not saying that any of the community pharmacies are not that. It's just that I feel like now that we are being allowed to obtain vaccine and, and disperse it, that that's one of the areas that we need to focus on. And it's not that in the past we haven't had the resources. It's the fact that we have not been allowed to um, be provided with the vaccine. So we, we have a lot of people um, in this department that have trained for um, you know, this type of scenario for a long time and, and we're, ready to, we're ready to do that. So, so it's a little shift of focus in the sense that you know, contact tracing needs to still be there. We still have the state contact tracing collaborative that's still viable. And, um, and we will let them take some of them so we can extract um, our nurses to focus on vaccine. And, and, and quite honestly, um, just the models that we see, the, 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 the science behind it, the, the vaccine's the only thing that's gonna get us out of this. It's just, it's, there's just no question about it. Unless you wanna go back to mat mandates for other control measures, if you wanna go back to mandates for masks, if you wanna go back to mandates for limited gatherings, if you wanna go back to mandates for social distancing, then we can do that. We know that works, that all of those things work together. It's a symbiotic relationship. Masks, social distancing, limited gatherings, personal hygiene. Those are all the things that got us down when we flattened the curve before we even had a vaccine. Now we have a vaccine. We're not faring any better than we were before that. In fact, you could argue that it's worse because if we didn't have a vaccine, that number this week that I'm looking at that's 99 could be 199. So that's where we're going to go with it. And, and nobody wants mandates. Nobody wants, you know, to go back to where we were of limits and, and limiting gatherings. And, and, you know, everybody wants to go business as usual. That's fine. But then our role clearly needs to be to provide people with a trusted, reputable source. With, we'll, we'll punch our city of Westfield name all over that. And Bay State Noble is also willing to do that. So the the you know this is this is where we need to unveil a new plan, and that's the direction I'd like to go. How is our vaccine rate this week? So interesting uh, dynamic that happened. <clears throat> Never thought mathematically that this could happen, but our vaccine our vaccination rate went down this week. So that How was did kind that of. Happen? It was kind of a little, a little bit jarring when I came in this morning and I looked at that. And so what happened was, is ever, so they based the vaccination rate on eligible population. So ever since they made the five to 11 year olds eligible mm -hmm. to be vaccinated, it increased the pool of candidates. And since the five to 11 year olds cannot by uh. time be fully vaccinated, 
um, the, the, the pool of, of candidates grew, the, um, the lack of fully immunized people in that pool decreased because they cannot be vac fully vaccinated yet. There hasn't been enough time. So we went from 54 or 55% down to 50%, uh. um, which is, you know, you can talk about herd immunity all you want. It, it, <laughs> this is not, the, the, the thing that we need to do is we need to increase that rate. And in Western Mass and surrounding communities that I keep track of, that are comparable being Chicopee, Holyoke, West Springfield, and Westfield, we're still lower than all of those other communities. So we can do better than that. And the city is going to make a concerted effort to offer that to be more convenient um, and, and maybe more, more trusted. I don't, I don't, for lack of a better term, I don't know what else to say, but we need to immerse ourselves in that now. Joe, do you have dates yet or places where these clinics are going to be? No, this um, it, actually we, we planned on kind of um, assembling to get this done last week, but we had to put some fires out in the school department and um, we need to, to kind of steer them in a direction where they're going to have to rely less on us so that we can be free to go and, and do this program. So I don't have a date yet, um, but it's not, it's not going to be, um, it's not going to be long. I mean, we, we're, we've done this for years and years with flu clinics. We've assembled. Um, one of the things that I would ask is that at some point, and Juanita, you did this at one of our flu clinics, and you were a physical presence on the site to answer questions and concerns from residents about that, um, the process, the vaccine, whatever their questions would be. And we have offers from Bay State Noble for um, Dr. Shukla and, you know, others to be present. Stan, if you wanted to, to be just there, um, and it's not, a, it's not a full, you know, all day commitment or anything. It's a couple hours that mm -hmm. I, I think it goes a long way when, when you say, and I'm not really, again, I'll reiterate, I'm not taking anything away from the corporate entities, the community pharmacies. They're doing a fine job. They've, they've helped us out a lot. We weren't able to do our flu clinics this year and stop and shop. Uh, they stepped in and, and they did all our seniors at the senior center because we weren't able to mobilize that. So great kudos to them. But I think that, I, again, if they're, and you have to remember, we know what we know and some people just don't know what they don't know. And I think the hesitancy needs to be addressed in the sense that you know, we're banging our head against the wall over here because we know the science and we're, in, we're engrossed in this business and this is what we do every day. Um, but if there is hesitancy and if it's as simple as I don't want to go to a place where I don't know who these people are, I don't know who the person is that's going to put the shot in my arm at one of the community pharmacies and I want it done. And if you don't have, I don't know, maybe you don't have a, a primary care person. Maybe you just don't want to go there, whatever the reason is. We, there, there, there's some just huge disparity. And, and so at least we'll try this and we'll see if that makes a difference. And, and other communities are doing the same. We're not going to abandon contact tracing. Um, we need to still continue to do that. Although there is word that the state contact tracing collaborative is going to disband at the end of this month which is extremely concerning. Um, so, you know, we might try and bring in more resources to supplement that. Uh, and, but I'm, I'm fingers crossed that the governor is going to allow that program to continue and, and fund it so that we can at least get through the winter and, um, and hopefully we'll see some better light in the, in the springtime. Um, so, you know, the numbers are what they are. Everything's out there. We know the science. This needs to stop. And we are at such, if the general public feels like they're done with COVID, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hear about it. They don't want to deal about it, deal with it. Just imagine what we feel like. This is so unbelievably mentally, physically, and emotionally draining every single day that I need to, <laughs> to prevent any more attrition from the department. I need to make sure that we start moving in a direction with a solution rather than just, you know, a treatment. So that's what I have to say. Any questions from the board? Um, 
Joe, was I know we talked before about there was going to be a mobile unit for I mean, is it for vaccines? Any news there on is. that? Yeah, there. Um, the state is doing their kind of tour of the Commonwealth. They have a max mass vax bus is what they call it. Okay. But also, I just heard today from Bay State that they also have a mobile unit. And that if we make that request, that they will make every effort to have it available here um, to bolster our efforts for vaccination percentage increase. So that was nice to know. I'm wondering if it would be a good idea um, if that van could or the unit could go to like an event there. There's going to be a lot of crowds like, you know, it sounds crazy, but a football game, a big football game where people might, you know, be waiting for their kids to finish a game and say, oh, I can get a vaccine now, you know? I'm just trying to think if there's a way, I know you said it's been parked at City Hall once and not many people came. I'm just trying to think outside the box and mm -hmm. if there's events where the van could go to. Yeah, I mean, that that's happened kind of a little bit. We had, mm -hmm. um, we had a, a, a I think it was through curative health that there was a, a van, a roving van for offering vaccination. But again, those are all great. And, you know, even one from uh, from Bay State Noble, I think would be a little bit more well received. We did have <clears throat> the state one that was here, like you said, in the city hall parking lot. But that was all such a last minute thing. We didn't really have a time to promote it. And, I, and in all honesty, even though it was a, a beautiful thing and it, it was very impressive, um, when I got on that bus, I would have been quite intimidated if I was there to get vaccinated. It was very unfamiliar. It was very unconventional. And um, it was not uh, the, the environment that I would elect to unless I needed to be in to receive a vaccination. I'd much rather be at my doctor and have them tell me all the other things that are wrong with me too. So, um, uh, the, but I think that that was, there wasn't enough promotion done with that. We just didn't have time. But if we have a Bay State Noble, you know, um, mobile vaccination unit that we can promote, that we, that people see that name and they understand, they trust it, they recognize it, um, that might, go a long way. And, and also in conjunction, like I said, with the, um, the city health department now being out there as a presence to offer this to people. And hopefully they'll feel comfortable that we actually know what we're doing. So <laughs> we'll see. Sounds like you put a lot of thought into this and we appreciate it and we appreciate all you do, Joe. And I have to tell you, and, and for everybody that's still on the call, I appreciate all of your input and all of your opinions. And you know what? We might not all see eye to eye, but at least we're here because we're concerned. Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the things that we do every single day. So thank you. Anything else? Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't know if you were yeah. talking to me or somebody else. <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> I, I've said everything I need to say, and, and I appreciate your support, and uh, I appreciate all, you know, the people that are on the call right now. Like I said, I, I mean, this is a community effort, and we all know what we want, and we want to be done with this, and we want to be out of this, and we want to have, we want to stop having people be affected one way or another by anything uh, related to the uh, COVID-19. So, you know, we're doing, we're doing the best we can. And I can't even believe that we're almost at two years and we're still having to have this conversation as the primary focus of our agenda. It's, um, it's disheartening, but nonetheless, we're up to the task. And, and, um, and so, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Margaret, Stan, you all set? Yeah, yeah, I, make yeah. Them I appreciate the update, Joe. All right, 1840, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, guys. Good night, everybody.